Buenos días a todos. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to wait one minute until we have all our, all our audience here. I see that the number is increasing. So let me wait 20 seconds and we start. 20 segundos o 30 segundos y empezamos. Voy a esperar hasta que eh, empiece a hacer toda nuestra audiencia. Veo que está subiendo el número, así que denme unos segundos más y empezamos. Bueno, vamos allá. Voy a empezar por logística. Eh, primero, mil gracias a todos por estar aquí. Es un placer tenerles en esta conversación sobre el futuro de la educación, cómo se van a ver las aulas, la nueva normalidad. Eh, it's a pleasure to have you all here. Eh, we are having a really interesting conversation about the future of education, how schools they are going to look like in the new normality. Esta va a ser una conversación en tres lenguas, español, inglés y portugués. This is going to be a conversation in Spanish, English and Portuguese. Pueden escuchar la conversación original en este canal. Si se quedan aquí, lo van a escuchar en los tres idiomas. You can listen the original conversation in this channel. Pero también se pueden conectar a través de interpretación, si lo prefieren, a un idioma determinado. Tenemos inglés, español y portugués. But if you prefer to listen the conversation in only one language, we have interpretation. So you can listen in Spanish, English and Portuguese. Si se quieren conectar a interpretación, tienen un botoncito en la parte inferior que dice interpretación. If you want to change the language, you can connect um, in the lower part of the screen and you will have interpretation there. Um, yo creo que ahora ya puedo ir en, en español. Entonces, solo un detalle más. Para, para que funcione bien la calidad del sonido, vamos a tener todos los micrófonos apagados y vamos a dejar 15-20 minutos al final para preguntas de la audiencia. Nos las pueden mandar a través del chat. Ahí vamos clasificando todas las preguntas. Sin más, le doy la palabra a Marcelo Carol, que es nuestro gerente del área social del BID y va a ser el moderador de este panel. Gracias. Gracias, Pablo. Bienvenidos a toda la audiencia. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, obrigado. Um, uh, voy, a voy a primero presentar a nuestros panelistas y este es un panel de, de grandes expertos, de amigos y también de eh, socios. Así que darle la bienvenida primero a Miguel Brechner, que es el fundador del Plan Ceibal de Uruguay, eh, con el que hemos trabajado ya por casi 25 años, Miguel. Eh, entonces no voy a revelar cuándo empezó esto, pero ya revelé cuánto tiempo. Eh, John Quinn y, y Michael eh, Fulham que son los directores del Liderazgo Global, Nuevas Pedagogías para el Aprendizaje Profundo de Canadá, eh, también grandes socios con los que hemos estado trabajando y pensando cómo cambiar los sistemas en América Latina y no solamente eh, las escuelas o los maestros, y van a hablar más de eso. Y, y ah, por último, pero no menos importante, Denis, Mis, Mis, Desni, Denis Misme, perdón, Denis es eh, CEO de la, de la Fundación Lehman de Brasil, eh, una fundación que tiene un impecable récord de trabajo eh, en Brasil, que siempre ha sido alguien que nos ha eh, proporcionado no solamente conocimiento, sino también grandes oportunidades de partnerships. Así que, bienvenidos a todos. Thank you for being here. Welcome. Uh, I appreciate especially this since uh, these are so complicated times. Uh, in, in complicated times, uh, uh, you know, uh, forces us to talk about complicated issues and also to try to make them more easily understood and, and, and workable for our government. Uh, and that's one of them is the school of the future. Everybody's struggling with that conversation nowadays. And we'll try to shed some light on what's uh, coming up. Uh, let me start as, always, as we always do with a short video just to jumpstart the conversation. And I'm going to go to questions immediately to our panelists. Go ahead, Pablo, please. Nuestro país. Empieza el día en gran parte de las familias hoy en nuestro país. Cocinas y salas de estar convertidas en aulas improvisadas. So, uh, this is this this is not uh, and the panelists told me before we start this conversation. This is not the picture of the future. This is a picture of the present. But now I'm going to ask Joan to start the conversation here, saying, you know, what is going to be Joan? 
the school of the future, or, or at least what it should be the school of the future, taking advantage of what's going on today. So, Joanne, welcome. Thanks so much. Um, certainly, we're going to see a, an uneven future for the next few months because times are uncertain. And what we're seeing happen will be some hybrid form of looking at a combination of what we've been doing and back in school. We know nothing replaces the teacher. Children are craving that social connectedness. But we've also learned a lot about how to utilize the digital world. But at the heart of it is, how do we want learning to look as we move forward? We've got to make it something that is engaging for kids because a lot of them are opting out during this time when it is strictly online. And we need to engage them in what we call deep learning, where they are um, active, they're co-designing, they have voice, they have some choice. So in the future, uh, we see that being a much more interactive process where we take digital and put it as an accelerator and an amplifier of learning. We don't use it to just transmit information, but we use it as a way to connect people around building knowledge and moving forward. Thank you, Joan. Dennis, how do you see the School of the Future if you think not only in Brazil, but in the world? What, what do you see? I think definitely what we're seeing is not because this was an orchestrated or a, a incremental process, we saw that technology invaded education, right? And a lot of the barriers that we used to see uh, as stopping the use of technology in schools, uh, they, they disappeared and mm -hmm. others became way more concrete. So connectivity to the poorer families, it's way more concrete now, the effects of not having it. Uh, teachers using technology on their day to day, it's a barrier that mostly disappeared, right? People are, are embracing that. We're seeing states in Brazil in public schools where 100% of the teachers are using regularly Google Classrooms with their students, right? We didn't think this was possible before. Uh, so my, my general sense is that the school of the future will have more of this interaction made possible by technology more present in a very active way, as Joanne said, making schools in remote places having access to things that it would be impossible to think they could have, and also interacting with each other in a different way. This all in a purpose of making learning more meaningful, right? And mm -hmm. not, you know, on the purpose of making technology more present. What we're aiming at is making learning more meaningful and making students more engaged with school and more ready to life when they leave school. And technology is now part of life, so maybe it will be part of school and schooling as well. Dennis, let me ask you a, a real question there. Uh, uh, many people are saying that uh, this is essentially an acceleration of things that were coming in, 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 in education and many other areas, but let's take uh -huh. education. Others are saying that this will be a break. And it, 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 we talk about opportunity. Is this an acceleration or a break? I think it's mostly an acceleration. I think uh, it, for education, I mean, of course, in the, in the short time, when you have to use uh, uh, technology like that, it increases inequality, right? You're mm -hmm. just making inequality more visible on one way and you're increasing it because private schools, you know, are keeping their day-to-day -day lives and a lot of public schools are unable to do meaningful learning, right? But if you look at the medium term, I think it's a great equalizer. It could be if we work, if we design policy for it to be, if we empower teachers to use it properly, if school districts are, are fully connected, right? Uh, it, it could be. So I'm, I'm looking at this more as an accelerator because this was a conversation that was happening. This was part of what teachers were experimenting. I give you one point of data. Uh, we, we sponsor uh, um, a, a, an, an institution in Brazil called Nova Escola which is very well known and has been around for 30 years supporting teachers. Nova Escola produces, helps teachers produce high quality lesson plans, for example, and they made it available during the pandemic. Brazil has 2 million teachers. In the month of May, 1.3 million teachers use Nova Escola's lesson plans, right? It's, it's mind boggling, right? This, this number was 30,000 a year and a half ago. Right. So, and this is high quality, and this is just one kind of material that was always available, but now teachers felt the need because they saw this was connected to like remote learning and I think this is just one example, right? So I feel teachers are embracing this. They are afraid, they are, uh, there are a lot of issues going around, but, but I think, I mean, schools are more open. 
And school openness uh, to change is one of the hardest things to get, right, in, in, in education reform. And, and I think now the pandemic created this, this new need. And, and let's, let's hope to make the best out of it. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, Michael, um, so the school of the future is the school that you imagine a year ago it would be the ideal school or it's a different school? Well, it's different, but it's in the same direction as we were working in. It's just uh, different circumstances that may help or, or not. So I think the first thing to say is to re remember that in 2019, the schools were not serving the needs of very many children, North America included. Uh, and so it wasn't working, the public school, for most students. So COVID comes along, opportunity to uh, certainly uh, disruption and people are vulnerable, but then the qu question is, what's next? And here, I think, uh, we've been working with groups, just as Dennis said, that are, I call it, pent-up innovation. Mm -hmm. They want to innovate, but they weren't able to. Now they're able to. Uh, my fear in Latin America is that what might end up by way of policy is going backwards, not forwards. That is technology, make it available, not the depth of pedagogy, policies imposed or run from the top, whereas the really this innovation is bottom up, coordinated by the top. And that's difficult to do in our schools, uh, and there's several countries, we are, we are working with those pent up innovation to make the policy and the practice jump into the future in a substantial way that serves, uh, uh, serves the needs of uh, well-being and equity and really does that. But again, we're, I would call it moving forwards. We can see it happening in pockets and we can leverage it to some systems. Uh, the worry in Latin America to repeat it may be moving backwards if we just let it happen. Michael, that's, that's a, a, a very good segue to my question to Miguel. So, Miguel, ¿tiene razón, Michael, de tener miedo? Eh, estás en mute. Absolutamente. Ahora eh, sí. yo, ten, yo tengo mucho miedo que ante el susto que se pegó todo el mundo con la pandemia, volvamos para atrás en viejas prácticas. O sea, la, o sea tengo mucho miedo de que esto nos agarró en offside, nos agarró mal parados a todo, y entonces todo lo que queremos hacer es sustituir los que no tenían tecnología poniendo tecnología sin pensar más. Y yo creo que el, el, la esencia del tema es que pasó una cosa que nunca hubiéramos pensado que pasó, la rigidez del sistema educativo se destruyó en la pandemia. Entonces empezó a pasar una cantidad de cosas que nadie pensaba que podía pasar, mucho más autonomía de los docentes, mucho más lo que podían hacer, mucho más cómo comunicar, en cada país hubo actitudes, obviamente hubo cosas diferentes, y eso es clave. Entonces volver para atrás, tratar de que ahora volvamos a hacer lo mismo que antes, solo que híbrido, sería un suicidio. Hay que aprovechar para hacerlo distinto, hay que poner tecnología al servicio de los proyectos, de las nuevas pedagogías, de estar conectados, una de las cosas principales que tiene que hacer la tecnología cuando el chiquirín no va al aula es estar conectado, pero eh, o sea, yo estoy muy asustado de que el sistema político eh, entre en el facilismo de decir esto es más tecnología, de todas maneras hay que probar tecnología y hay que resolver el tema de la conectividad no puede ser que un maestro pague la conectividad para dar clase y un niño pague la conectividad para tomar un, un, un trabajo o hacer algo. Entonces hay muchos temas que hay que definirlos, hay que definir los problemas y cuáles son las soluciones. Conectividad. Lo voy a dejar para el final porque esta es una conversación que tiene que ver con educación pero con muchas otras cosas. Ahí hablábamos antes del panel del tema de telemedicina y acceso a telediagnóstico. ¿no? Eh, también es un tema de conectividad y creo que vale la pena volver a ese, a esa, a ese tema. Eh, hablemos un poquito más de los profesores, ya que empezamos a hablar de los profesores, les prometo que después hablamos de la escuela de nuevo. Tengo otro video para mostrarles, Pablo. Emily Hutchison would normally be reading this book to her students in person, but the reading and math teacher at Norwood City Schools is making do with video lessons for now. Not bad hair on my chinny chin chin. There's not a choice, so you just have to make it the best that you can, and I'm gonna like work really hard. So then it's, uh, immediately I go to you because you, you, you talk about uh, teachers embracing or out of necessity 
and embracing technology in order to teach. Uh, we, we were very insistent before the COVID on the idea of that they needed digital capacities and digital awareness to do that. Are we talking about a different level of skills, a different level of capacities? I think a lot of the debate on, uh, around the use of technology in education stopped in the 90s when education hmm. was hard to use. So we were talking, I mean, Miguel was talking about this uh, before and I couldn't agree more. I mean, after, you know, Apple, after technology is basically opening a box and clicking and touching, I mean, everybody learned to use Zoom, right? The, the whole world is using Zoom or similar technologies like we are uh, doing here. And so I think in a way, this was more of a psychological barrier. Like we were stuck when technology was something hard that you need to have like IT training uh, for the teachers or digital literacy for the teachers or the students or the students would be more advanced than the teachers. I think that's simply not true. Teachers are using smartphones for a very long time. They use email for a very long time. They use WhatsApp uh, in Brazil and Latin America for a very long time. And, and, they, and, and it's fine. I mean, they are using social media. Uh, so I, I, we, I, I don't see that as much as a barrier as going back to like, what, how can this help learning, right? Mm -hmm. what, what we should be focusing in our work with teachers is how can you like deep your capacity uh, uh, to teach your students, to engage your students, right? I think sometimes when we're discussing things that changed because of the pandemic, we forgot they were not perfect before, hmm. right? There were a lot of issues. I mean, most kids were not learning during, they spent 12 or 14 years of schooling in Brazil and 92% of them finish high school not knowing uh, what was expected of them. So this is the problem. Technology might be something that will help us do this slightly better, but we need to think like as, as technology, as a tool that is going to empower us to do better, but go back to the agenda of like how we're going to make sure uh, we are having a meaning, I mean, that, that learning is happening, right? That we're not talking about education, talking about kids sitting in schools for many years or many hours a day. This is not what education is about. What education is about is about learning and learning needs and the social aspects of it. So we need to make sure that this is happening. And now we have a new ally, which can be for good or for bad. It depends what we, we do with it, which is uh, technology, right? Thank you, Dennis. Uh, I, I, I love the, the idea of st being stuck in the 90s, uh, you know, and, and I think that you're right. Uh, but uh, let, let, me, let me challenge a little bit Michael here. Uh, Michael, you, you've been exposing with Joanne a, a, a different way of thinking about education and, and we really appreciate that uh, and I think that is consonant with what uh, both Dennis and Miguel were talking about but uh, I you know the the mediation of technology with hybrid education uh, you know the the less face-to-face -face, uh, contact and, and one of the factors that we have is that in Latin America probably we're going to have 30 percent of the kids not being able to go to school physically every day, simply because of question of spacing and infrastructure. Uh, can you do deep learning in hybrid situations? Uh, how do you do it? Is that a problem or is that a, a actually an opportunity? Well, the, the first problem, just to reinforce uh, what I said, and I think what Dennis was saying, is that I, I'm afraid that technology will be superficially attractive to policymakers. Hmm. And that will dominate systems in hmm. a problematic way. So, the, so the, the question is, how do you get at those pockets of innovation that we're already starting, but have been um, uh, um, you know, accelerated in pockets uh, with, with the COVID opportunity? And so uh, I think that uh, the direct answer to your question is, we have revamped our materials in the last uh, six weeks okay. uh, to uh, focus on virtual examples of, of uh, creating groups, small groups, and social interaction and collaborative solutions. And they're built into our model to begin with. Now that we have the uh, new opportunity, there are pluses and minuses. The minus is it's a little bit harder to connect if you're not in the same room. The plus is it's also easier sometimes and that there's, uh, there's a lot of ways and we are, uh, I mean, everybody's creating it 
in real time because mm -hmm. the conditions mm -hmm. are, are, are new and real. But I, I'm, I'm confident not because of the theory, that too, but because we're actually doing it and we can point to systems that are, are actually better off post-COVID than they were before, even though they were trying to innovate before. So this can be done. It is being done. It's going to require a concerted, a concerted effort on to make sure the bottom-up energy is, is identified and connected and that the policies don't get in the way. That's super important, Michael. And, and, I, was, and I was itching to ask you that question because I thought about your, your ideas, the one that you've been pushing, and, and, and how do you actually work to adapt them into you know, much more a hybrid situation that we will have. Uh, Miguel, eh, let me take, uh, 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 me encantó esto de que los políticos eh, pueden estar superficialmente atraídos a la tecnología. Eh, esta es una historia que vos ya viste varias veces, digamos, ¿no? Entonces, ¿cómo, cómo nos aseguramos de que devices, connectivity, que son muy importantes, no roben la conversación sobre lo fundamental de que es cómo hacer educación de una manera distinta? ¿Qué, qué tenemos que hacer ahí con los políticos, Miguel? O sea, yo siempre creo que en la crisis tenemos una oportunidad. Ahora todos quieren comprar devices, ¿está? Pero ¿Te vas a acordar llama... algo? <ríe> Dale, vas a acordar darle. a muchos, solo que pasaron 13 años y que hay otros devices hoy que antes no había. Igual sigo creyendo que es muy importante tener devices ah, y es muy importante tener acceso. Pero yo creo que la oportunidad está. Quieren comprar devices, perfecto. ¿Cuál es el modelo? Ponemos devices que tengan internet, que se puedan conectar, que tengan los contenidos básicos en el device. No hablamos en genérico. Eh, lo peor que hay es el genérico. Tenemos que definir qué, entonces, ¿qué vamos a hacer? Eh, eh, tú mostrabas un video de, 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 un, de una de profesora leyendo. Tengamos clubes de libros en los devices, donde se puede participar del estudiante y los docentes, tanto en primaria como en media o en secundaria, con los libros. Entonces, la lectura es distinta si la estamos leyendo entre cinco en un device. Pero tenemos que pensar, ¿qué le ponemos al device? No, no, o sea, y no es pasar videos, no hay manera sostenible de acá a fin de año que la gente mire videos, no es sostenible que torcéis un año más estemos todos hablando por Zoom, va a tener que encontrarse maneras diferentes de trabajar. Entonces, es fundamental los devices, sí, es fundamental que la escuela tenga acceso sin lugar a dudas, pero es fundamental que lo que le ponemos al device tenga sentido para el estudiante. Si yo le pongo una plataforma de matemática que puede trabajar offline y online, y es un juego, y está adaptada al currículum, el chiquilín va a ser matemática, pero va a ser matemática porque además le gusta jugar y porque además puede ser, ahora, si además de hacer eso, tiene que hacer un proyecto, investigar, y tiene que ver cómo monta, mide la altura de su casa para poder trabajar con sus compañeros sobre la caída del agua, cualquier ejemplo adicional, va a aprender mucho más, el instrumento, no, o sea, nosotros no podemos pensar en la tecnología para replicar el aula, tenemos que pensar en la tecnología para que explore más el estudiante. Y volvemos al concepto este de la rigidez. Hay una realidad que voy a hacer, voy a decir una cosa que es muy mala desde el punto de vista de políticamente correcto. Este año nadie va a perder el año básicamente porque los sistemas políticos van a aceptar que se atrasó la gente y que no se puede medir. Entonces, que eso es una oportunidad para que puedan hacer otra cosa los estudiantes y que después a mi fin de año podamos medir otras competencias, habilidades. Si no, volvemos a la rigidez del currículum, volvemos a la rigidez de que perdimos seis meses, ahora vamos a meter seis meses en tres. Es una locura. Gracias, Miguel. Joan, um, so, another thing that we've been struggling with, and, and we always have the question is, okay, so, uh, hybrid education, uh, this uh, new reality could be more easily adapted for kids that are further up in, the sc in their schooling and less adaptable to those that are just starting their schooling. How do we square that circle? How do we work around that? Uh, it is much more challenging with the little ones. I agree. Um, but I agree also with just what we've heard from Dennis and from Miguel as well. It is all about how we create this different kind of learning. So thinking that they are going to be sitting and looking at a screen as a five-year-old is just not realistic. But how are we going to create um, ways for them to interact with one another so that the purpose of screen time is not just to receive information, but to connect with others. And that would be a really important thing to build in there. 
But as we look ahead, um, I think the answer lies in creating um, these provocations or problems or challenges that kids need to solve. And when Dennis talked about his examples that have now gone from 30,000 to you know, over a million downloads of teachers looking at what other teachers are doing, we can create some meaningful ways for kids to do things while they, if they have to be at home so that they can connect. And then the purpose of the Zoom or the connection is to share what they've been learning. Um, and we've seen this happening in our, our groups and our partners in eight different countries where they already were thinking in this way. And in fact, in Uruguay with the deep learning moments, they realized the longer problem-based learning that they had been doing was not going to work online. So they created shorter challenges. Um, Miguel used an example, we, you know, the child goes outside, they start measuring the home so that they can figure out different activities. So it, it means teachers need a set of skills where they know what the big outcomes are and what do we want kids to learn. And then they think of a different way for children to get into that. And so I think it's really promising from that perspective, but then we also have to help teachers collaborate in new and different ways. But that's what we've learned from this too. Instead of saying you must have a professional learning community, they can't wait to get ideas from one another because they're all up against a challenge. And so they're wanting to share. Let me see if I understand Joanne there. So you see there, and I, 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 I wanna be sure that I, I understand you correctly. You see here an opportunity to re-equip teachers because they do have a challenge that they didn't have before. So this is what you're saying. What you're saying essentially is we can reset a little bit the conversation here. They're, they're is open that correct? To change. They're open to change because we all need to change and do things differently. So yes, we can reset. I don't mean that it's going to be a ponderous way of new learning, but to say one of the big things that I think is good during this COVID is people had to say what's worth learning. Instead of trying to just push out a lot of curriculum, what do kids really need to know? If I'm only going to have them for an hour or two, what's important? And overall, that's what we've been saying for the last many years. We need to focus on what's really the big ideas kids need to learn, then figure out how they can best engage with that learning, not just be told it, but to solve problems, to do Super. authentic tasks around Thank it. You. So that's the big change I think that we have. Thank you very much. Dennis, you're gonna be up next, but let me show you a video because the question is gonna come with the video, okay? Go ahead, Pablo, with the third video, please. Main concern would be for the kids who are part of what we call that digital divide. The kids who don't necessarily have access to wireless uh, or to devices. We so Dennis, you talk about the opportunity of an equalizer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, 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 you know, I actually wrote it down here for me uh, to to have this conversation later offline with you. But let me ask you this: What's going? What's going on? What do we do with those that are not connected? That you know, even if they are connected, they don't have the capacity at home to actually do. And, and this is a, a conversation that's going on here in the U.S. quite a bit, which is you know, middle class families. They have the uh, human capital at home to substitute for what schools are not capable of doing it. Those that do not have the capital, the social capital at home are falling behind, even if they are connected. So yeah. let's talk about equalization and how do you see it? So there are two big ideas here. One is there are many things we're not going to solve until there is a vaccine, right? And I mean, we, we are not going to be able to replicate a perfect education model in the middle of a pandemic with all the issues. We're not going to be connecting. So it, it's going to be very hard. So we have to think about how to mitigate the risks right now. And I see a few things that can, can help mitigating that, that we have been involved with in Brazil. So the Lemon Foundation about the same day that we started, I think it was March uh, 16th, uh, we started to put together a, a broad uh, task force with 35 foundations and civil society groups in Brazil and all the state secretaries of education, municipal secretaries of education to help them navigate through the pandemic, right? And I think a big part of our focus was how to ensure equity, 
And mm -hmm. in, I don't know in other countries in Latin America, but the tradition in Brazil, if you have a, 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 a big like uh, um, um, environmental disaster, or if you have a, a strike, you don't think about how to keep kids learning. You simply stop and nothing happens, right? And sometimes this can take months and nothing happens. Kids are going to be uh, sitting at home and not learning. So we didn't want that to happen during the pandemic in Brazil. And I think a lot of the efforts that were put together were now being able to see the results. And, and I think there were two components. So we know by now, I was telling you earlier, we just launched today uh, uh, research showing that 74 percent of all the public school students in Brazil are actually continuing to study using online uh, uh, um, learning. So that's for a country like Brazil with 40 million students, that's a very significant uh, 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 number, but it shows still that we have one in four who are not studying. So what, what we're doing there, like number one is the use of television. Uh, you know, houses who don't have tech access, which don't have access to to internet have access to television, that's the reality. So we've put together four hours of uh, uh, content organized by each grade, aligned to the national learning standards and organize what we call the focus map. What are the key competences? Exactly what Joanne was ta talking about earlier. What are the key competences that we cannot learn? This content has been available and has been distributed using public uh, broadcasting, like public TVs, educational TVs, legislative TV, so you can, you can put it out there. The second thing is if you have access to internet, but you, don't, you cannot pay for data, right? You have access, but you have a prepaid. And what we, we did that in partnership with many state level uh, uh, departments of education is to make it the data for free, right? So the student don't pay for the data when they are using the applications connected to their schools. And that's very important because this can be used in the future. Uh, to, to kind of organize access in a way that you don't need to provide 100% connectivity, but you can make sure that you're not charging for the data that is for educational purposes. So I think these were two ways to mitigate. In the, in the I mean, looking forward, what we need to do is just to, we need to connect all the schools. That's a must. Schools were not part of the connectivity hub in Brazil. That's a problem because you make learning less personal and you have more generic kind of broadcasting, but not interacting, which is critical. And the second thing is we have to think about access to uh, 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 connectivity from the student perspective. It's not hard to solve. Connecting all the schools, we know how much it costs. There is a plan in Brazil to do it. We need to do it faster. I mean, other countries have, Uruguay is a, is a big example, but we, we need to do this faster. And I don't want to mon monopolize, but there are other thoughts around that I can share later on. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, Miguel, uh, entonces, eh, pensando en toda Latinoamérica y en los chicos que no tienen acceso a eh, conectividad, mucha gente ha hablado entonces de, como hizo Dennis recién, de la televisión. También he escuchado mucho sobre el tema de eh, radio y en algunos casos, en la mayoría de los casos, incluso material impreso. ¿Sí? La, las viejas te tecnologías análogas. Eh, ¿Está bien ese mix? Eh, eh, ¿Soluciona Mira, el problema? Yo, yo creo que tenemos que pensar el problema en una nueva óptica. Eh, digamos, está bien, en la emergencia todo vale. Entonces yo no critico nada de lo que se hizo en la emergencia porque todo vale. Ahora, si vamos a hacer televisión, hagamos una televisión diferente. O sea, ya, hay, ya está pasando una cosa que decía Denis, que estamos de facto simplificando el currículum. ¿Por qué? Déjame, Porque... déjame interrumpirte un minuto ahí. Denis, so a question for you. So, when you talk about TV and what you did for TV in terms of adaptation, it was already there or you put it all together when the crisis started? Did you have a TV that it was meaningful before? No, the TV, I mean, there were content that was available for TV that was meaningful before. Uh, okay. TV Futura and okay. Fundação Roberto Marinho, yeah. they had content. But, uh, but uh, we also helped like uh, teachers to learn how to do Got this, it. like broadcasting. Got it. And I think what Miguel was touching on is what we felt is what normally was going on is just teachers teaching, right? Speaking. And what we found out was way more effective was the more kind of using TV at what they can do best. And Understood. this is content that was already ready because it, it was really hard 
to film it and use studios uh, during the pandemic. Thank you, Dennis. Miguel, sorry for interrupting. Pero, por ejemplo, en Uruguay, ahora apareció la televisión en un enfoque súper interesante de desafíos, de desafíos chicos. Se hizo todo de cero desde Ceibal con la NEP, pero o sea, hay que adaptar. Lo que pasa es que acá volvemos a, a, a una filosofía que hemos discutido muchas veces, que es que lo mejor es tener una institución que se ocupa de todas estas cosas para que se vaya armando. Yo creo que hacer cosas sin que el estudiante tenga retorno pueden servir para la emergencia. Pero hay que buscar el retorno vía WhatsApp, vía SMS, vía lo que fuera. Hay que emular lo más posible la conexión con el estudiante. Porque yo creo que la emergencia es la emergencia. Después va a haber que pensar en otra cosa diferente. Y es la oportunidad. O sea, el hecho que que seamos más flexibles con el currículum, da para pensar una flexibilidad y hay que pensar, digamos, el tema de la conectividad que recién hablaba Denis, no es tan sencillo si querés que todo el mundo haga Zoom, es más sencillo que si querés que accedan a la plataforma educativa, pero si vos no, yo he estado hablando con todos los operadores, con Amazon, con Apple, perdón, con Amazon, con Microsoft, para evitar que la, 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 las plataformas te cobren. ¿Entendés? Lo que creo yo que hay que hacer es un, un sistema, una especie de operador virtual de la educación en América Latina, que tenga muy claro unas reglas que no son las reglas comerciales de telecomunicaciones, entonces todo el mundo pueda tener acceso. Pero creo que usar lo viejo no hay más remedio en la emergencia, pero lo nuevo hay que repensarlo, o sea, hay que repensar sistemas que se actualicen una vez al día, y, ta, y el resto poner servidores en las escuelas donde hay wifi y donde se puede hacer muchísimas cosas sin tener que hacer, eh, eh, o sea, una especie de, de, de copia de imagen de lo que estoy haciendo en cada lugar. Hay muchas formas de resolver la conectividad, pero es un tema que en general le sobrepasa a un ministerio de educación. Mm. Miguel, ya. Yeah. Uh, there is a question here of whether it's a national policy of no the issue of connectivity, whether it becomes a public good or not. Pero como, como, o sea, si algo quedó demostrado en esta pandemia es que la, la, el, el, la digamos, el, la diferencia entre los que más tienen y los que más tienen existe y que la tecnología la aumenta. Eso quedó demostrado. Entonces, tenemos que hacer todo lo posible. Yo entiendo que no tiene, o sea, que no hay que salir en la discusión del ancho de banda. Hay que decir, los materiales educativos, las clases en Zoom, todo eso es un Zoom mundo mucho más chico. Y que en la mayoría de los operadores de telecomunicaciones no tiene costo adicional, es marginal. Pero hay que resolverlo. O sea, no era un problema resolver antes, pero sí es ahora. Entendido, entendido, Miguel, y gracias. Eh, estoy de acuerdo con eso. Eh, Michael Joan, it's a luxury to have you here to discuss the next topic, uh, which is the promise of personalized uh, adaptive learning. Uh, mm -hmm. You were in the forefront of this conversation. Uh, many colleagues are telling me now, well, you know, now we are at the, uh, at the beginning of a real conversation about this. And it's not only about technologies because the adaptation that everybody had to go through. Uh, so let's discuss a little bit of personalized learning. Uh, in the context of what's coming up or what should come up uh, in the education system. Michael, do you want to start with that? Yeah, I do. Um, and just building on this conversation so far, uh, we've had the one, uh, I'm going to say we need a small number of examples, among mm -hmm. other things we're doing, that have a system quality. And system quality means grassroots is involved, uh, the middle we call it institutions, and some degree of connection with the policy or the, uh, the Ministry of Education. It might be a, a province, uh, it doesn't have to be the whole country. And with, so the Uruguay one was a particular version, that's done and that's fine, it'll do that. So I'm not talking about replicating that, but I'm talking about, and I do, I'm thinking of the, the situations we have connection with, uh, Brazil, Chile, uh, Costa Rica, whatever, three, four, where they would undertake a province in Brazil, the way that Dennis is talking about, where they would say, let's put this together on a, you know, a multi-year basis. Uh, the connectivity, as everyone's saying, is essential, but it's the easy part once you do it. The harder part is the learning and interaction that would occur. And we have to learn from these new focused examples that have a system quality. That's what we have to, we don't know how to do it until we do it. We have mm -hmm. to start doing it and learn from it. That's the priority. Thank you, Michael. Joan. 
Well, I think if we talk about personalized, we need to be careful what we mean by that word. And I think that's been the problem all along. Everyone has a different definition. The one thing we know from surveys of students is they do not want to be automated. Mm. So they don't want some sort of, just because you have them sit and plug in answers on a device instead of doing it from a textbook does not make it better. So what we need is a different way of thinking about that learning that personalizes it by making it meaningful, by making it relevant, by making it authentic, that builds in problem solving, um, applying their learning in new and different situations. And that goes back to, to what both all the speakers have said. You know, we have to be clear about what's important to learn and we call these competencies. It's not every single fact, it's what are the big ideas that they need to be, be learning about and then creating multiple pathways, ways for them to do that. And also to how to do that collaboratively, because I think that's been the biggest problem during this disruption is people feeling isolated and that the best use of technology has been to bring them together so that they can think together, collaborate together, um, solve issues together. Um, John, is, is this something that we're, are we asking too much from the teachers? Uh, no. This is a conversation that we always have, no? Whether, whether it's too much asking from the teachers, if you know, they actually can do this transformation, uh, what's, what's your opinion? Well, we've been working in eight countries for the last six years, and we found that teachers are dying to do this. Okay. Um, most of them will say, this is what I came into teaching to do. This is, I know, once they see their children being engaged and excited, then they want to do it more. So it's a matter of just giving them some of the tools and the ways of thinking about it and ways, good examples. Um, as Dennis said, when people see something that works, it gives them ideas. Uh, but we can't just say go out and do it and not give them any support or examples at all. But I think teachers are, are quite capable of so much more. Look at how they've risen up to this challenge during this very disrupted time. But we need to make it easier for them because they're exhausted right now. And we need to find ways to help them learn from one another, as Michael said. Marcelo, go ahead. Can go ahead. Make Absolutely. A, when, when we're discussing what kind of technologies, right, and what we call personalization or mm -hmm. what we call like engagement, I love the expression that I learned many years ago from a professor from the University of Washington uh, when he called some uh, ed tech chocolate covered broccoli, right? <laughs> so, this idea that you say, oh, this is an educational game. It's fantastic. It has a lot of gaming. And then the kids go and they scrap the surface and they find this big broccoli, broccoli. that they don't care about, right? And, and the whole gaming or gamification, as we used to say, it's just like, uh, it's not meaningful, right? We have to start thinking more about like, what are the things that we can really uh, uh, when I talk about equalizer, I'm not talking about today, right? I'm talking about the future. If we think technology as an equalizer, uh, I think one, one example, we, we support a, a, a startup in Brazil called Arvore de Livros, so Book Tree, and they're kind of a Netflix for books, and they put together virtual libraries, right? So, I mean, I think 70% of the schools in Brazil don't have a proper library. So you can put together a virtual library and kids can take the virtual books. And the difference is that you know if they read it or not, and you know what was highlighted and what are the books that are more uh, popular. And this is all integrated, right? So this is, so you can use this every time, right? This is not chocolate covered broccoli. That's, that's useful. That's, I mean, reading is important and we measured it and kids do learn more with the virtual library than without, with the, the regular library. So, why not? Like this is, this is important. Uh, another example I think is just because we're using so many languages here today, right? Is uh, learning a, a second language is something that is so important in terms of skills for life. And it's something that is so hard for schools to do, even private schools, right? Mm -hmm. And you watch now, you know, people learning online with a native speaking teacher in another country. Why not? Like, why not do this on regular times? and increase like the way people are going to speak better English and better Spanish and better Portuguese and, and, and things like that. I mean, you can do this in regular times as well. Once you, you, you realize that you don't need to limit everything you're learning from the teacher that you're selected randomly to be you know, uh, uh, in classroom with for a year. You don't need to expect that from the teacher or to limit the kids uh, uh, to that one teacher experience. So, 
I think I think these are the interesting things that that we, we I mean these are just two stupid examples but just I mean there are so many others that we can think so we have to avoid the idea of like the the chocolate covered broccolis out there the platforms are going to gamify the education experience and with because this this is not going to, to work. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, I, I want to be clear here. We fully endorse uh, broccoli, if you like broccoli, okay? Of course. <laughs> I love broccoli. <laughs> so, yeah. Me too. Yeah. But thank you very much. I, I, I love that expression. Thank you, you very much. You can cover your chocolate in broccoli if you want. Uh, there you go. That, that, well, I try that. I don't know if we're going to do well or not. But in any case, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dennis. I, I, I'm going to start with questions because we have a lot of questions. So I'm going to try to make it very, very breezy. Uh, so to start with, uh, Joan, uh, I have Claudia Diaz Rios uh, is asking uh, this question, and, I, and I'm paraphrasing. So take it as it is, okay? Because I, I, I'm not going to make uh, justice to what Claudia is asking uh, completely. But she's asking about the possibilities of students actually connecting to each other. Uh, we, we talk quite a bit about uh, teachers but not to peer-to-peer -peer interactions in this kind of situation. And I, and I know that when you think about deep learning, you're thinking also about learning from others. How do Absolutely. we take advantage of that, Joan? We're definitely thinking about students connecting because that's what we mean by the engagement. Uh, they want to connect with their peers, whether it's with <clears throat> their cohort, their class, their school, but also across the world. Um, one example that I'll just give is from Australia where mm -hmm. So a number of our schools got together and created this Our Schools. It was a place where students are writing their stories about how they have dealt with the COVID time and they're publishing them and they're connecting all over the world. Um, other teachers were trying to create, um, it was a book study, as you mm -hmm. said, Dennis, but they were doing it with a school in Ohio and this was another school in New Zealand. So connecting their kids across the globe as well. So that's going to be a really important way going forward is um and that's what i meant about using technology it we always get into the debate is it you know personalization or not personalization it's all about learning that's the most important thing so how do we make the learning deeper better richer and what digital tools might help us do that and the important one is connecting kids so that's super important and i wrote it down i think that we we need to move when we talk about personalization, we need to define it very well. And simply a computer, you know, spitting out, uh, you know, content that it seems to be personalized is, is far from being personalization. That's super clear. Uh, Darling del, Mer del Carmen Mercado Gutierrez eh, pregunta, Miguel, ¿cómo motivar a los estudiantes a la enseñanza remota con conexiones inestables, con poco ancho de banda, etcétera, etcétera, digamos? Eh, Ha habido conversaciones sobre eso también, ¿no? Eh, estoy seguro que lo que Denis dice es verdad, están conectados. La pregunta es, ¿están realmente conectados? ¿no? A ver, seguramente están conectados un rato y después se desconectan. Uh -huh. Lo único que conecta mucho tiempo, o sea, es muy difícil estar conectado una hora. Eh, o sea, por algo las charlas TED son de 18 minutos y por algo algunas cosas demoran poco. Hay que preparar materiales en ese sentido. Si vamos a tener dos años de conexión, hay que prepararlos diferente. Hay que pensar en modelos tipo online, eh, MOOCs, en vez de tener un profesor del otro lado. Hay que innovar, no podemos repetir para atrás. Yo, yo creo que las dificultades de... O sea, En los lugares donde hay dificultades de conectividad, tenemos que trabajar lo más posible offline. No le podemos pedir las cosas que no son. Son temas distintos. En los lugares que tenemos buena conectividad, bien. Perfecto. Ahora, un libro se puede leer con baja conectividad o sin conectividad. Lo único que tenemos que tener es que los dispositivos tengan el libro cargado y que se lo puedan cargar. O sea, yo, yo creo que es muy importante entender las limitantes que tiene el problema. La limitante de conectividad es un problema, pero el, el estar conectado mirando una pantalla cuatro horas también es un problema, o sea, resiste temporalmente, pero no resiste un año, o sea, pero pensémoslo en escala de las universidades, ¿usted piensa que una universidad va a poder dar todo el año clase por Zoom? O sea, va a haber una cantidad de gente que va a decir, para eso hago Coursera, hago MOOC y hago otra cosa, O sea, hay que o sea, tenemos la oportunidad ideal de plantear nuevos escenarios diferentes 
Imagínate un escenario en secundaria donde la cantidad de materias están en formato MOOC y vos tenés que dar un examen. Y vos las estudiás a tu ritmo y te la bajás a tu dispositivo donde podés cuando vas a clase transitoriamente. Es totalmente distinto a esa solución que estar en una solución escuchando a las 7 y media de la mañana o a las 10 de la mañana y con videos cortos y cuises. O sea, hay, hay mil otras maneras de resolverlo. Gracias, Miguel. Denis, eh, Alexandra. Hernandez de, de Washington DC, look at that, says, well, you know, you talk about engaging and learning. What two of the questions, the, the, of the words that uh, she, she puts here in the, in the, in the, in the question for you. Uh, it, she's, she's asking whether somebody's listening to the needs of the kids. You, you mm -hmm. told us about the, 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 the survey that you de, did and, and the question, for, I think that it's, you know, are we listening to what they need? in these uh, solutions that we're putting together? I think good teachers and good providers of solutions should be, right? They are the clients in the end of the day, if you want to go to the business analogy, or they are the, like, the subjects of the right to education. If we're thinking about public policy, I don't think kids are listened to a lot mm. in these processes, but I think when you see uh, effective applications and when you see, I mean, the number one thing that, that you can differentiate if there is a good technological solution or, or not is if people actually engage with it, right? And we can, you can see this very clearly, what pe things people abandon. And I think the good providers and the good like developers of teaching materials and good teachers, they have learned how to listen to, to the kids. And we need to, to do that. It's, it's a two-way street, right? we're not going to create the schools that are perfect for kids uh, because there, there is an intentionality in education, right? We, we have a pedagogical intention here, but if we can combine that with things that are more uh, 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 attractive uh, to kids, I think that this would be uh, really important. We are currently doing a, an effort that the, the, uh, your colleagues are participating, Marcelo, to do scenarios of what's going on with education in the future. I've been we following have this, that with a lot of and interest. We have these students in the group. It's a group of 25 people and two of them are students and they are participating, which I think at right. least gives us some idea of, yeah. of, of where they are. Thank you. Michael, a lot of questions about, uh, you know, the, the deep learning, a new school, a new, for, new way of doing education. So Paulina Cordova is asking here, uh, how do we convince parents and, 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 you know, to, to actually embrace and demand this kind of education? So uh, through, their, through their children uh, is <laughs> one uh, opening way of saying it. But the, when we think of this, this ties together uh, students, teachers, and parents is what I'm going to say. And it's, our model is exactly that, the learning environment elements. And the way, what's important to students are purpose, meaning, belongingness, making a contribution, being part of a team. Those are the learning attractions and incentives. And so our model uh, uses those in relation to the student-teacher relationship. And very quickly for the, in, in the history of education reform and uh, even in North America has not really focused on parents, uh, parents as recipients. Now they have to be active, proactive and they come in early in this triangle of the parent, the student, and the teacher, or multiples there, because they're groups, is really the catalyst that makes this come together. And we've seen it time and again, students coming home to their parents, being excited about what they're learning. And so the definition can't be one piece at a time, it's gotta be the triangle. Super, thank you, Michael. I think that that clarifies a lot what Paulina was asking. Uh, let me, uh, I mean, you know, since I have the privilege of being the moderator of this panel, I, I can also do some advertising. So let me do some advertising. Sorry, Michael, but you know, it's part of the business. Uh, uh, so uh, I want to ask Andrea to uh, tell us, uh, Andrea, my colleague, Andrea Bergamaschi, uh, uh, our education specialist in Argentina, but working throughout the region, uh, to tell us a little bit about what we've been doing. Uh, so to have two minutes, actually, Andrea, to tell us what we're doing as, as the IVB. Uh, so, allow us for the uh, institutional advertisement for a moment. I hope that it's going to be of, of use for everybody in the audience. Andrea, bienvenida.
Eh, hola Marcelo, buenos días a todos eh, y a todas. Gracias por la oportunidad. Voy a tratar de hablar muy rápidamente para, bueno, para mencionar un poco eh, lo que estamos haciendo y muchas de esas frentes que se comenta, que, que nuestros panelistas hoy nos comentaron. Eh, primeramente, eh, el trabajo que estamos haciendo del equipo de tecnologías en la, de, en la educación, de BID, eh, que sí tenemos mucha información relevada sobre las respuestas que los países de América Latina dieron durante la, la, eh, la, el cierre de escuelas, por supuesto, durante una emergencia, y con base en este trabajo ahora, estamos también internamente eh, organizando escenarios posibles para entender cómo podemos mejor apoyar a los países eh, con el uso, por supuesto, de, de la tecnología, con este enfoque que estamos hablando de eh, resignificar y repensar la escuela del futuro. Eh, eso por un lado, hay un par de publicaciones que, que tenemos eh, y que estamos eh, subiendo al chat ahora y que pueden después también acceder a nuestra página web, que creo que Pablo va a mencionar al final. Este, y, y bueno, eh, también estamos eh, relevando información eh, de otros países de Europa, sobre todo los que están ahora ya en la, en la etapa de reapertura de escuelas. Eh, y eso es algo que eh, también estamos eh, constantemente poniendo a disposición de los países a través del blog del banco, a través de la página web nuevamente que Pablo va a mencionar al final eh, del banco y, eh, y claro, y a través del trabajo también a nivel local eh, en todos los países eh, donde estamos presentes. Así que, usted menos de dos Gracias, muchísimas gracias. gracias. Ok, bueno, miren. Uh, at the end, uh, the time comes to say thank you. So uh, let me thank you, each of you, our panelists, not only for the conversation today, which was great and I learned a lot, but also for all the work that we've done together throughout the years uh, in order to improve uh, education in, in our countries. I think that that's uh, something that we were all proud and committed to. So thank you very much. Thank you for being good sports. Uh, and uh, I hope to see you uh, very soon offline. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, now Pablo to take over, and with that, I say goodbye. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos. Ha sido buenísima la conversación. Les hemos dejado todas las publicaciones en la parte derecha del chat. Eh, también les voy a toda la información que ustedes necesiten recoger eh, con respecto a lo que estamos haciendo durante esta crisis del coronavirus está en www.iadb.org barra el slash coronavirus. Lo ha apuntado también ahí en el chat. Eh, solo ¿Hacemos quiero... la rutina de siempre? Sí. ¿no? Sí, w es w, 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 para los que hablan otro español, digamos. Dennis, I'm sorry, but you know, I need to do the translation here for those that are not... Lo siento. Solo una cosa más antes de despedirnos. Ay, perdón. Sí, sé que tenemos una clase entera de la Universidad Cecotec de Guayabil, de Guayaquil, Ecuador, conectada. O sea que les mandamos un saludo a todos. Y nada, con esto cerramos. Gracias y, y volvemos dentro de poco. Hasta luego. Chao, chao.